So I watched this debate on spying philosophy versus James, our very own James uh, Fodor, I think his last name is. Um, our very own. <laughs> well, I watch a lot of their streams. They do him and Nathan do these like eight-hour streams, and I'm on board for a lot of them. I watch at least two or three hours. They usually on a, on a Sunday morning, Saturday night, and I'm usually up around that time. So I watch. I don't know. I watch from like twelve to one, and then go. My wife will usually get home, and then I'll eat with my wife and come back, and they're still streaming. It's like 3 o'clock in the morning, California time, and they're still going. And then I'll usually watch for about a half an hour and go to bed. Um, so I, I know James. Now, I was really excited for this debate, and i got to say I was somewhat disappointed in the final outcome. I was really excited for this debate for a reason, because I actually am pretty familiar with James. I've watched a lot of their streams. Of the, uh, there's a, of the umbrella of arguments that Michael Jones has that, he, that are sort of fall under the physics, um, his physics arguments, there's about five. I want, they're, they're a few years old at this point. There's quantum idealism, digital physics, the holographic principle, the end of materialism, and maybe one or two others, I don't remember. Um, he's debated this twice that I've seen. And both times I was really disappointed in the outcome. I did a video about the, the Matt Dillahunty one I posted about three weeks ago. Um, and T. Jump. In both cases, I didn't think why, a big part of why I was disappointed is that, and this is why I was really excited to see him debate James on this, is that James actually has the standing of all the people we know out here who are like local yokels and stream. He's the only one who I can think of who has the actual standing. I'm pretty sure he's got a PhD and may may even be physics, but he's the only one I think of I can think of who has the actual standing to like start talking about the interpretations of quantum mechanics who will have read the physics papers and know what he's talking about and won't just be talking out of his butt. Most of the other people, all these big brains, all these big brains quantum mechanics people who have been debating me on Twitter of late, you know, whatever. <laughs> the, the people responded to, a, I posted my IP versus Matt Dillahunty video to somebody, and I, I got this long guy debating me on, you know, there seems to be a couple of key objections to Michael Jones's arguments. One guy's like, you know, Michael Jones, he says the conscious observer is what causes the collapse of the wave function, and I wasn't really sure if that's what was being asserted was accurate to what Michael Jones was saying, but I didn't really feel like going back and watching the videos and deciding where he got that from and if he was right. So there seems to be a couple key objections out there that Michael Jones is somehow either uh, quote mining, he's taking some of the quotes of the physicists out of context and reading different you know, having different interpretations of them. He's not exactly representing the studies accurately, and he's relying on opinions that are in the minority, all of which could be true. Um, re relying on opinions in the mi minority is probably not true. My understanding is there is no consensus opinion on quantum mechanics that every opinion out there by a physicist is to some degree a minority of opinion, it has its adherence, and there's no consensus opinion. But other than that, all the other all of the other objections could be legitimately true. That's why I was hoping that this this was going to settle some of that, and we we're going to put some points on the board for not quite Christianity, at least for idealism versus materialism, because that's where I think the strongest possible argument lies for our side of the table, and that doesn't necessarily mean Christians. Um, it doesn't. But. So what happened? Well, it, it kind of devolved really quickly into a kind of standard issue. It, so I, I was excited for that reason. I really think, I, if, you're, if you're not familiar with James, I really honestly think he's, he's really sharp. I, really, I swear to God, the kid is really bright. And I like listening to his, his analysis of things because unlike others... He seems to me to have really, really thoroughly well-versed in a lot of stuff. And unlike other people in this space, when he brings up concepts or arguments that he just kind of name drops, if you go Google it five minutes after he name drops it, he's almost always representing it accurately, precisely, or telling you he doesn't have enough information to represent it accurately or precisely. So he's usually pretty solid in terms of um, integrity and 
you know, like, he'll, he'll drop something like, what was he talking about? He was talking about nominalism, deflationary nominalism, which is what he calls himself, and he'll drop something like Quine's, Quine's, uh, what's it called again? Quine's proof of the necessity of mathematics or something like that. I forget the exact term for it. And you go Google it five minutes later, and he pretty much nailed it. He, he assessed it accurately, and he, he represented it correctly. So I was excited to watch this. I was hoping we were going to put some points on the board for our side of the table. It kind of turned into a draw, roughly speaking, and it devolved into kind of a standard issue, theist versus atheist kind of debate about, you know, it didn't quite get so bad if God is all powerful, why can't he, why can't he create a box so big that nobody can lift it? It didn't quite get to there, but it started devolving into one of those standard issue, like, you know, tedious abstraction of theological points, and that's, that's not where I think the real source of the, of, of where I think the most value could have been. What I really think the most valuable is, is James has a weak spot. James is probably one of the sharpest guys in the atheist community today. I really think so. I could be wrong about that, but it really seems to me like he is. Um, and unlike T. Jump or Dillahunty, he could actually challenge the physics legitimately, and I could, you know, I was hoping they were going to have a real conversation on those points. It was going to go over my head somewhat, but then I'd have a really good grasp of, of you know, where, where the issues were. Um, the weak spot where James comes in is that, and it's the really weak spot as far as I'm concerned, is that he is a materialist. Now, that is probably because he was trained as, or as a physicist or a scientist at the PhD level, and those people all tend to be that. And that is the reigning dogma of the scientific community. So one of the things you'll hear T. Jump say time and time again, you're just wrong about that. All scientists, 95% of the scientists are materialists. And they'll start saying that 50 times in a debate. That may be true. But it is trivial, true, and irrelevant. It's like saying all of the Marxists raised, raised up to believe in Marxism believe in Marxism. It's a meaningless statement. Why? Because the scientific community is steeped in the dogma of materialism, and materialism is, as almost positive, untenable. And that's the real place where we should be debating. That's where the real fire is. That's where we can really put some points on the board. That's what I was hoping was going to happen. So, let me break this down. I know I'm going to say this a lot in videos to come, but it's worth understanding fully. So if I get repetitive with this, you know, suck it down. It's a YouTube video. Grow <laughs> up. It's YouTube video. It's repetitive. You already said this. All right, shut up. <laughs> so people already complain about my Bigfoot analogies. You know, Bigfoot analogies, I, I say, I, you know, people said I was repetitive with my lavender oil analogy. And then I go look at the atheist comments, and, and every single thing that I was repetitive and painstaking about, people said time and time again, and they're just not getting it. So if it seems like I'm repetitive, the fault is you. Why? You ain't getting it. So that's why I'm repeating things. But here's something I will go over time and time again in videos to come. Materialism, to me, seems to be untenable. On the way out. Over. Kaput. It seems like that could be a debatable proposition, but I doubt it. Here's the evidence for the conclusion. When you are talking about a philosophy or worldview, it has to have three key areas. One, is it parsimonious? Two, is it, does it have explanatory power? And three, is it logically coherent? Explanatory power is materialism's key calling card. Once you separate the world into stuff, you can study the stuff, you can heat it up, you know, if I heat this Bunsen burner, uh, write this down, and if I heat it to 120 degrees, this is what happened to the material inside, and you can take studies. It's the very basis of the scientific revolution. Materialism has extraordinary explanatory power, that is why it's the reigning dogma of the scientific community for the last three, four hundred years, or three hundred years, or whatever. And it is still a dogma in the brains of scientists to this day. Why? Because it has enormous explanatory power. If we heat this water and now we got steam and we can use this steam to power an engine and voila, the dawn of the Industrial Revolution was built on materialism as its guiding light. So it's going to be hard for a certain type of person to recognize that it is logically incoherent, but it is logically incoherent. And this was obvious right at the, right at the jump, right at the dawn of the quantum era. 
That's why people say quantum mechanics is so mysterious, it's so complex, it's so hard to understand. The, the implications of quantum mechanics and its implications for materialism were there right from the start of the quantum era. And it's not, if you're one of these big brain people who are going to debate me on Twitter, just hear this clearly. It is not contingent. The things I'm about to tell you are not contingent on any interpretation of quantum mechanics winning out over any other ones. So Michael Jones can be wrong about all of his interpretations of quantum mechanics and what I'm about to tell you will still be true, hold true, and be valid. The measure, there are two key problems for materialism and they are insoluble. Materialism is untenable because it is logically inconsistent with itself. It doesn't cohere. And there are two, at least two, insolvable problems. Here's the first one, which is the easier of the two, the hard problem of consciousness. Now, I'm not going to go into this in detail. Again, I got into a big debate with somebody on this Twitter last week where he was insisting I explained the hard problem of consciousness to him. And it wasn't something I made up on the spot. He could watch the videos too. It's really easy to understand. Go read the literature for yourself. That is an insolvable problem for materialism. But it is the easier of the two unsolvable problems to solve. So if you're all geared up to tell me how physicalism is going to solve it, put, put, your, put your big brain down because it's the, the other one that is even harder. And that's the measurement problem in physics. And if you're about to get your big brain up to tell me, oh, you don't understand, it's not even the collapse of the wave function, that's not even how we, we talk about it anymore. Okay, great, it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. If the problem is right from the dawn of the quantum era, the problem was there, the ghost of the machine was there, was obvious, and was staring everybody in the face. When you are taking a measurement of stuff, when you are observing something, you are measuring and you're writing down, you're heating it up, there is something there perceiving and observing and measuring the stuff, the conscious agent. In your scientific study that is being written down on paper about these things over there, X, that is forever being unaccounted for. That's the real measurement problem. Materialism is untenable. Materialism, materialism posits that material itself is the ontological primitive of, the, of reality. The fundamental building block is stuff. This cannot now nor ever be. Why? Because forever being unaccounted for is the observer themselves, the perceiver, the person writing down the equation. The ghost in the machine was there from the, from the jump, and it was really obvious. So if you are left between a choice, between idealism and materialism, idealism is the only one you could head towards. Now, there are other in-between, uh, there's a lot of other options on the table. There are people who are, 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 are talk about panpsychism, different types, and there are atheists who clearly understand this and argue, um, I don't want to get too much into this, but the strongest argument I've ever heard against Bernardo Castro was from John Verveke, and he's an atheist, he doesn't believe in God. Bernardo Castro doesn't believe in God necessarily either. But the strongest possible argument being made was kind of a, I don't, atheism with neoplatonic categories is really hard to un, uh, explain and understand, but it's a very complicated in-between position between materialism, a strict materialism, an eliminative materialist, and an idealist. But if you're left between a binary choice, materialism, idealism, idealism is the only one that makes any sense. Consciousness itself is the ontological primitive, Period. There's no contradiction there. You know right now that you are perceiving. Consciousness exists. So that is the only thing right now that you can be sure of. That you are hearing and perceiving me. That there is a real material world outside of your doorstep. Sort of. But it only exists relationally. It does not have standalone ontology. Now that is a fact according to the physics. And that's not contingent on any one interpretation winning out. There is no standalone ontology to the real material world. Every single solitary physicist will disagree about a lot of stuff. But at the core of reality, they will all tell you the same thing. That at the quantum level, you are talking about patterns of excitation and waves of probabilities, and that's it. Okay, no standalone ontology, just like I said. Materialism stands or falls is entirely contingent on there being a real material world. 
and re realism of that sort is on the way out. If there is a real material world at all, it exists relationally. It has no standalone ontology. Now, this is where I'm going to start getting repetitive, because I'll use this example a lot, but this is the clearest example I can think of. Just like velocity, and I'll use this in videos to come, but it's a really clear example. So, I don't know, suck it. <laughs> suck it. Just like velocity has no standalone ontology. What does that mean? It only exists relationally. If I say to you, you say to me, Craig, how fast is that train going? I say, that depends on what? You get it now? On where you stand in relationship to the train. If you're standing on the ground watching it go by, it's going 100 miles an hour. If you're standing inside the train, it's standing still. You get it now. Hence, there is no such thing as a standalone ontology to velocity. It's the same idea with the quote-unquote material substrate, the real material world. There is no standalone ontology to it. At, its quantum, at the quantum level, it is patterns of excitation and waves of probabilities. And every physicist will tell you that same thing. They have the different interpretations are trying to account for that fact, but that is a fact. And that means materialism cannot be true. Period. Fact. Both of those things are facts. And that's not even introducing the hard problem of consciousness. Materialism is not tenable. The reason why it is such a powerful hold on people's minds is because it had such awesome explanatory power. But it is on the way out. It's just a question of when. How fast people... Between materialism and idealism, idealism is your only choice. There are in-betweens. There are in-betweens, for sure. But James isn't one of the in-betweens. He's a materialist and eliminated one at that, I think. I could be, I'm not, if you're listening, James, I don't know if you are. Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. I don't, I don't know. If he's, but if, if you are, I think you're an eliminated materialist. I could be wrong about that. I'm not trying to misrepresent you. I'm just, I'm just trying to say materialism is on the way out. If you're not a strong materialist, more power to you. Join us in Christianity. I'd be happy to accept your tithes. Join us in Christianity, get James. It's really fun over on this side of the, on this side of the, the place, uh, this side of the YouTube YouTube environment. You know, the only the only downside is you got to call up, you got to pony up some cash, but that's fine. You know, you're a physicist, you're probably rich. I don't know if he's a physicist. Something, he's something big and important and be spectacled and highly intelligent. He's a really sharp guy. He really is. Um, so I was hoping Michael Jones was going to get bring that up. Because Michael Jones has an end of materialism videos. He's the one who got me started on this. Michael Jones quotes Bernardo Castro. He's the one who clarified this in my mind. If you do not agree with all of the implications of idealism, that's fine. But it's way stronger and more tenable and more logically coherent than materialism. Materialism is basically over. The other way of thinking about it to clarify just how over it probably is. I mean, I'm willing to debate this. And if you see me on Twitter of late, I've been debating these quote-unquote big brain guys, <laughs> but they're basically, they're, they're, they run scams on you just like the other guys do, except their scams are, you know, tell you your interpretations of quantum mechanics aren't correct. My interpretation of quantum mechanics are irrelevant. I'm not a physicist. don't care. I, under, I can understand what the implications are, and those implications were there right from the start. Think of it this way. Let me see if I have time, and then I'll explain it one last way and tie it all up in a nice pretty little package. Oh, I got some time. Okay, so think of it this way. If you take a photo of something, you take a picture of something, that picture is comprised of what? Pixels, right? Pixels and pixels alone. But when you are looking at a photo, you are representing, no, that's not a photo. That's not just pixels. That's mommy, and that's daddy, and that's, who's that weird guy in the background with his pants down? How'd that guy get in the photo? That's what you see when you look at the photo, correct? But you are creating those realities. That's the perceiver who is creating those identities. According to the photo itself, it is comprised of pixels. Think of materials in the same way. The, the, the table in front of me is stuff. The atmosphere right next to it is also stuff. At the quantum level, indistinguishable from each other. 
patterns of excitation and waves of probabilities. The only person I am re-representing it back to myself. So there is a standalone ontology there, sort of. Sort of, but only in relationship to the perceiver. The only thing that you can actually say is... Uh, we, so it only exists in relationship to the perceiver. So just like your photograph, you, the perceiver, are making the distinction between mommy, daddy, and weird guy with his pants, weird Uncle Bob with his, with his pants down. I know, it's weird. It's your family. It's not my family. Let me just clarify. It's your family, the photos of. That doesn't happen in my family. A nice Christian bunch of people. Well, no, not exactly. <laughs> but, but, but we don't have weird Uncle Bob with his pants down in the family photos. That would be your family, not mine. But you do get the point, right? The photo is pixels. The differentiations of, the, of what the photo is of, the representations and the re-representations are, are from the perceiver himself. They have no reality. Actually, they're convenient fictions or fictions or they're not quite make-believe. They're real. I mean, it's really your mom. It's really your weird Uncle Bob. But according to the picture itself, it's just pixels. It's the same way of thinking of materialism. According to materialism, it's just materials. But there's so much more happening than that. Well, that's the perceiver engaging with the materials. Now, this is why, I don't know if I'll go into the Schopenhauer now, but this was being perceived 200 years ago by Schopenhauer and most famously by Schopenhauer and Kant, where they talk about Kant has the famous noumena um, phenomenal distinction, and then, you know, Schopenhauer talks about will, the will and representation, how you are re-representing the real material world back to yourself. Now we are starting to find out that that's exactly what's going on. That's exactly what's going on. But that was known. That was known. That, that materialism is on its way out the door. There may become new types of neo-materialism or neo-sorts of, you know, ways of circling that square. But the type of materialism you typically associate with an atheist, like I've said in the past, that sort of Stone Age, you know... I'm super excited by science, but science circa 1907 is on its way out the door. It doesn't hold. The physics are debunking it as we speak. You know, if you, get, if you, if you even start to go with Carlo, what's his face, Ravelli, space-time itself, time itself may be the illusion. So, there's a lot going on here. But the long and the short of what's going on in, in the scientific community is undercutting everything they thought they knew about the world. This happened right from the dawn. This was, these implications were right there from the dawn of the quantum era. I swear to God they were. These, this, the, the reason why the scientists were so slow to see this is because of the implications. Those implications are philosophical and theological and they, they, they you know, it requires you to think about life in a totally different way than they had been used to thinking about it. But the implications are there. That's why, you know, I'll talk to someone like Jeffrey Williams on uh, Twitter, and he'll, he'll call himself an atheist, but he's got some sort of spiritual atheist or something like that. Um, to try and reconcile the obvious implications of the physics with the type of, you know, it used to be you were materialist, you were scientist, that's because you were, you know, a hard-nosed realist, you were big-brained and you wanted to think about what's true. Well, it's not true. It's not logically coherent in the long term. It's untenable. That's the point. And that's what I was hoping would put to where, where Michael Jones would really, you know, bring up. Because Michael Jones kind of knows this stuff. You know, if you're a Christian, you're kind of an idealist by definition. We all believe that God, you know... You know, I, before I knew the universe, I called you by name. So God, we were, began in the thoughts and the mind of God before everything was created. So if you're a Christian, you're by definition an idealist. And that's where I think the strongest possible counter-argument to what to, 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 to James is. Materialism is untenable. And that's what I thought the debate was going to be about. And I really thought we were going to put big points on the board. As it, as it was, um, I guess I'll wrap it up. I have more to say on the subject, but I will be making videos about it in time to come. As it was, you know, it was cool. I mean, they're both smart, and it was fun to watch them go back and forth, but it devolved 
into sort of your typical atheist, theist, you know, um, a pr pretty good, they broke it down on Kyle's channel on Christian Idealism, you should go check that out, because they went over James's objections, but by the time they got into that conversation, those were general, like, theological arguments, and that's not really what I was there to see. I was there to see the, the quantum idealism arguing, formulated correctly, um, argued really strongly to somebody who had the standing in the, in the intelligence to actually honestly point out what flaws it may have had. So I was hoping for something a lot different than what actually occurred. But, um, so, there you have it. You know, it's still worth watching to a degree. It's a cool debate, and they're two, they're two smart guys. And they start, you know, but that turned into a general theist, atheist debate, which it's not really what I was, it's not really what I was paying to see. So, <laughs> I wasn't paying anything at all. All right, well, you know, so there you have it. That's about my analysis of it, you know. Um, I guess I will be going in, I mean, this is going to be one of my go-to subjects in times to come. It's the end of materialism. Uh, and it's going to be up there with my religious experience arguments. And some of the other things that I bring up time and time again. So, I will cover this thoroughly in videos to come. But that's the long and the short of it in this, for this, where we are right now, in this particular time. That is all for now. The Mass has ended. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.